Hello friends. I hope you're having a good day today. It is absolutely beautiful out here in Northwest Arkansas. I think it's close to 70 degrees and sun shining. It is beautiful. I've got good news for you today. Jesus loves you. Isn't it good to know that Jesus loves you? And I've got a message that God's laid on my heart. Uh, I think that uh, uh, it could be one of the most important messages that you've ever heard because Jesus is coming soon and this is all about being part of the family of God. I'm going to start with a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with its excellence of speech or wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Friends, that is, all, that is what it's all about. So I want to start with a prayer and ask God to touch our heart today. Father in heaven, I've got a simple prayer for you. Open our eyes up today to who we are. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Open our eyes. Friends, it's all about Jesus and being part of the family of God. Nothing else really matters. I mean, it really not. We are not complete without Jesus. If you could picture a, a, a man, a silhouette of a man standing up and, and, and like half the person, the other person is incomplete, the line incomplete. That's kind of the way we are without Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the missing piece of the puzzle. You know, we're born, each of us are born with an empty spot in our heart, a, a void that can only be filled by Jesus. Now, I want to share a scripture with you and just see what Jesus said about this. It's found in John chapter 6 and verse 35. He says, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. You know, sadly... I tried to fill that empty spot with everything else. I, I tried to fill it with making money. Uh, I, I tried to fill it with, with buying things, with going places, with, with faster cars and, and a faster lifestyle, and all these other things that at the end of the day added up to a big zero, friends, a big zero. And uh, it just, uh, and I, I, I made a lot of money, but I blew a bunch of money, and I was just wasting my life. And all these things that the world had told me that this is where you get happiness at, friends, it didn't work. It didn't work. And I, and I thought to myself, there's got to be more. And I thank God about that time, someone just like you, someone just like you come up and told me some things that no one had ever told me before. Some things that, that, uh, that, was, that in the circle I run in would take a lot of courage. You know what he told me? He told me that Jesus loved me. And he told me that, that I was created for one reason, and that's to have a relationship with God. Nobody had ever told me that before. And I said, like I said, it took a lot of courage to do that. It takes a lot of courage because of peer pressure and we worry about what other people think to tell others about Jesus. Why do you think that is? It's because it's the devil. But I want you to know, I thank God that that man had enough courage to tell me about Jesus. And I can't wait to see him. Uh, he died. I was. I give my life to God. It totally changed my life. As we, as he, as he, uh, he introduced me to Jesus, and we studied the Bible together. And about two weeks late, later, after I was baptized, him and his wife was killed in a car wreck. But I cannot wait. When I get to heaven, I'm going to run up and I'm going to give this guy a big, huge hug, because that was the most important thing that anybody had ever told me. So. What an eye-opener it was for me. What a game-changer it was in my life. Friends, I want you to know something. We have a choice. Each one of us have a choice. Because of Calvary, because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary, because God so loved the world, because of that, we have a choice. Now, we can reject Him. We can reject Him. We can, we can reject our birthright as part of the family of God. But I want you to know something, friends. God is doing everything He can to persuade you not to do that. He's wrote a long love letter right here in this Bible, just to you and to me. This whole Bible right here can be boiled down to one effort right after another of God seeking to restore a broken relationship, bringing us back into the family of God. Have you ever been rejected? 
Have you ever been rejected by someone that, that you love very much? Maybe you can think back to maybe when you were in, the, in, in, in junior high or something like that. Maybe you could picture yourself being in the ninth grade like I was. And, I, and, and there was this young lady that was across the room over there. And I, and, and I was just mad, head over heels, madly in love with her. But she didn't want anything to do with me. Now, friends, I know you might laugh, but, but it hurt. It really hurt. But, but, but let's, on a more serious note, maybe there's some of you out there that's went through a divorce. You know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? It hurts really, really bad. I think the older you get, the more it hurts. And it, it, and it really does hurt. So uh, when you love someone, when you love someone deeply and they do not love you back and, 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 they, and that they just reject you, friends, the hurt goes real deep. God knows better than anyone else the pain from being in love with a people that don't want anything to do with Him. God knows how it feels standing in the shadows, longing for, hoping for a relationship that was someone that just doesn't care. See, friends, we were created for a relationship. A relationship of love. Now think about it. That's the best kind, right? A love relationship. My wife, my wife loves me and she cares about me. And, and it's a love relationship. It's not a forced relationship. You know, a lot of people can relate to this if you had a puppy dog. And you want your puppy dog to come running up to you with his or her tail wagging, right? We don't want the puppy dog to come up to us with the tail tucked between his legs, but out of fear. No, God created a love relationship. And that is really the, be the best kind. But with a love relationship, there, there's a risk involved in it. Rejection. Rejection. I mean, could you, I imagine, could you imagine God... Uh, the, the, uh, at the hurt that God experienced uh, from when Adam and Eve rejected Him. I mean, really, that was the first divorce in the Bible right there. Think how it must have hurt Him. You know, oh, how much He loved them and cared about them. You know, it's hard for us to wrap our mind around this, but they were so close. They were so close. They had such an intimate relationship with each other. I mean, picture God forming Adam out of the dust of the ground. Picture him, each part. I mean, he, you know, we, we have artists now and, and we, have, we have people in construction that, that can do wonders with their hands and their minds. But imagine God as He created the, the human body. As, as, he, as He, each little part, fearfully, so fearfully and wonderfully made. And then, he, and then He gets Him and He breathes the breath of life. Into, into Adam's nostrils, breathes the breath of life in, into to him. And uh, uh, it's just amazing. They, they, they poured out their hearts together, walking and talking uh, each, each day together. God would have given anything to make them happy. Absolutely anything. Uh, you know, the whole world was a gift from God. The, everything all around the beautiful blue skies, the beautiful birds, the, the flowers. And have you ever have you ever went deep sea diving and, and, and looked at all the beautiful and the colored fish? All this, everything was a gift from God. Everything was was a token of God's love to, to human beings. But sadly, our first parents rejected this love, believing Satan's lies. This was the first adulterous affair recorded in the Bible. I could just picture the, the, the deceiving power of Satan. Oh, I can make you so happy. I, this is what it takes to make you happy here. You don't need God in your life to be happy. I could just picture this and how it must have broken God's heart because He couldn't force them. He could not force them. So for 6,000 years, God has had to experience the pain of rejection. Over and over and over, the ones He has fallen in love with Him reject Him. I want you to listen to this love letter here. It found in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3 through 5. He is despised and rejected by men, by men a man of sorrows and, and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and, he, and, and, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. 
yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I love you this much. Can you, can you hear what this love letter is screaming to us, to each one of us? Friends, why did God do, do that? Why did Jesus go through that? Why did he take those lashings? You know, that whip, the cruel Roman whip that he knew that he was going to endure. I mean, because this was wrote hundreds of years. This prophecy in Isaiah 53, hundreds of years uh, before Jesus, before the cross. He knew what he was about to go through. But why did he do that? Why did God do that? Why did he, why did he take that, that lashing across his back 39 times? And that, that, that whip, that Roman whip had metal and bone. So every time it went across his back and it pulled back, it just lacerated his back. Why did he do that? Why did he allow them to put the crown of thorns, the crown of thorns over his head and then take a reed and hit it and where I could just picture it driving down into his skull and I could picture just the blood running down his face. Why in the world would he endure that? Why would he, and I could just imagine when he was about to be crucified on the cross and, and I could, there was a, a, on either side of him were the two thieves. And I'm sure they were fighting with every amount of energy and breath that they have not to be nailed to that cross. But why did he freely allow himself to be nailed to that cross, both his hands and his feet? Why did he do that, friends? Why? Out of love. Nothing but love. Love beyond what we could ever imagine. Talking about rejection, friends. Man, man, how he, what he endured for us. Because he loves us. Because He cares about it, us. Friends, it was the only way. It was the only way. You see, we have been lied to. We have been duped. We have been deceived. Our eyes are blinded, friends. They are. And He had to break that, that, that delusion. He had to break that grip that Satan has on our life. We are no match for the enemy and his deceiving power. There was no other way, friends. John 12, 32, Jesus speaking of, of this very event right here says, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. If, if Jesus was lifted up on the cross of Calvary, and that's exactly what he's talking about here, he said, that's the only way that I can draw my people, my children, away from the grip from the deceiving power that the enemy has on their life. Calvary screams to our heart, friends. Calvary opens up a door of a heart that nothing else can open up. You see, it's the, it's the goodness of God it's the, that leads us to repentance. It's the love of God that compels us, that draws us away from the grip from the enemy. If the cross it just screams out to all mankind, Believe me! It's like Jesus is screaming to you today, friends. Believe me, I'm trying to save you. I'm, I'm trying to free you uh, from the grip that the enemy has on your life. Friends, the same person that, that, that came up to me and came into my life that was somebody just like you shared with me also the cross, pointing me to the cross. Pointing me to the cross. I knew I was a sinner, friends. And, and Satan had really beat me up for that. But, but this friend pointed me to the cross and let me know, you know what? That cross says that His grace is bigger than my sin. That His love is greater than my past. His love for me. Friends, my testimony is about when I realized that. When I realized that God loved me. That He knew everything about me and He still loved me. And then He got up on that cross and died for me. It, it touched my life forever. Uh, my friend gave me a little book, just a small little book called Steps to Christ. Now, it was, a, it was an incredible book and helped me out so much because this Bible at that time was such a big Bible. And it carried me the scriptures in the Bible to help me meet Jesus. One of the scriptures that really gave me a very clear picture of Jesus was this scripture in John twelve thirty two that I just shared with you. And in that, the author said, <clears throat> uh, she says, the, the sinner may resist this love. But if the sinner does not resist this love, that he would be brought closer and closer and closer to God each day. 
And I, I had a little talk with Jesus that day because I'd made a mess out of my life here before that. And I said, you know what? I don't know how to be good. I don't, I don't know how to be a, a, a good Christian, but I'll promise you this much. I'm not going to reject you anymore. I'm not going to resist you anymore. And I want you to know God has been true to his, to, his, to his promise. He has drawn me closer and closer to Him each and every day. Now, I just know this is how much God loves me. Jesus went through this. He went this far to restore a broken relationship. God is drawing me and He's drawing you back into His family, restoring our relationship. Now, I want you to consider something. All your life, you've been told how much you need God. Have you ever thought about this? Has it ever crossed your mind how much God needs you? Think about that. That's a powerful point right there. Oh, how He wants to embrace you. Oh, how He wants to be part of your life, part of His family. He does, friends. Look what He went through. Does God need you? Yes. Desperately, He does. You know, let me ask you this. Parents, do we need our kids? Do, do we need the love of our kids? And, and young people, now I pray we got some young people listening. Do you need your parents? Of course you do. We need each other. We were created like that for a relationship. You know, we know the feeling uh, that we had, for example, uh, as parents. You know the feeling that you have when, when not forced or not even coaxed, you know, through, through offering something, that one of your children just comes up to you and embraces you and give you a big hug and say, I love you, Mama. I love you, Daddy. There's nothing that, that feels any better than that. Where do you think we get these feelings from? We get them from God. How do you think God feels when just out of the blue that you just drop on your knees and you say, God, I love you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for, your, thank you for Calvary for loving me so much. Friends, I know what it means to be set free. I thank God for what He's done in my life. Uh, he's been so good to us all. You know, um, one of the things that I was really concerned about in my own personal life is that I had just went too far. That I had just, that I was too far lost of a sinner. And, and that little book, Steps of Christ, led me to some scriptures in the Bible where a story in the Bible where this, these two men had come to the temple. Uh, one, one a publican, and that's like a bad, bad guy, tax collector, you know. And then the other guy, a Pharisee. And he was like real religious and everything. And the, and the real religious guy was going, Oh, I'm so glad I'm not as bad as that low-life publican sinner over there. And, and, then the, and then Jesus is telling the story. And then the picture changes to the, to the publican, the guy that knew he was a sinner. And he was just beating his chest and said, Oh, I know I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. And Jesus teaches us that the one that would receive the blessing that day was the publican because he knew his need of God. And then, and then, and then, and that, that, that touched my, my heart in a big way. And then there's another story that, that uh, Jesus tells in the Bible. Uh, when one day that, that Jesus was, Jesus was, um, uh, this woman had come up and he, Jesus was at Simon's house and this woman had came up and she was, she was washing Jesus' feet with her tears and then taking her hair and drying his feet. And, and the, uh, the Simon was thinking to himself, oh, if Jesus knew what kind of woman that was, he wouldn't let her touch him that way because she turned out that she, she lived a terrible life. She was a harlot, and, and Simon knew that. And so Jesus, reading Simon's mind, said, Simon, let me ask you a question. He said, two people owe you money. He said, one person owes you a lot of money, and the other person does not owe you very much money, but you, for, you forgive them totally. Which one's going to love you the most? And Simon thought about it, and he says, well, the one that I forgive the most. He says, exactly. Jesus says, the one, those that are forgiven most, love most. Friends, that changed my life. I love God for what He's done. I know what it means to be set free. Maybe you're the same way. Jesus knows you're a sinner, friends. He, but He got up on the cross, and He died for your sins. Praise God. 
See, I want you to know that God is head over heels madly in love with you. He is. He needs you. He needs you in His life. You know, He made you. And this is, this is so important to me. He made you for eternity. Wrap your mind around that. You know, would, would, would God miss you? Would God miss you? If, if you were lost for eternity, have you ever thought about that? Would God miss you? Would He even notice? With all of His other children in heaven, would He even notice that you were lost? Yes, friends. Calvary screams, yes, for God so loved the world, for God so loved everyone, friends, that, that He gave all. I want you to know you are a one of a kind to God. When, when you were created, God threw away the mold. He threw away the pattern. There's not another you on this earth. There's not another person that's got your DNA. There's not another person that's got your personality. Now, there might be people that look a little bit like you, but there's nobody like you. God created you for a special place right in His heart. No one can love you like God. If God loses you, there is no one to replace you. There would be an empty place in His heart forever. Friends, God is lonely. He's lonely for your love. No one can love Him like you because you were created for a special place in His heart. That, that, that can only be filled by you. Now, let me explain this. I know there's some mamas out there. There's nobody loves their children like mamas, right? So you're going to understand what I'm talking about. Let's just say, for example, mamas, that you had 10 kids. Yes, you heard me right. 10 kids. Imagine that. <laughs> but you know you love all 10 of them. Let's just say that one day your kids were outside and they're playing out in the, in the yard and, and, uh, and the ball is hit and, and little Joey is running out for that ball and the ball gets out there in the road and the worst of worst happens and Joey is run over and killed. That's sad. And, and, then, and then let's just say, for example, that I'm called as a pastor to, to be there for the family, especially the mom. So I go to the mom and I'm just wanting to help her through this. And I say, Mom, you know, I've thought about this a lot and, and everything. And I think it's going to be okay, you know, because, because now, now, Mom, uh, you're going you're gonna to have more time to spend with your other nine children. Do you think that's, that's going to help the mom out? No way. What about if I told her, Mom, uh, you know, you, you, it's going to be a lot easier. You know how much time you, f you spend in the kitchen and everything cooking for all these kids? Now, now you're going to have more time of your own. You know, you've just got nine kids to feed. You think that's going to make her feel any better? No way. By about that time, she's probably trying to hit me with the frying pan. Uh, and then, but what about if I say, Mom, look, I know how much it costs to raise a kid nowadays. You're going to have more money now. Would any of that make the mom feel any better? Would any of that? No way. It wouldn't. The, you know, she, she said, I'll tell you what that mom would say. She said, nobody but nobody can take little Joey's place in my heart. Nobody. You know, I want Joey is what she would cry. I need Joey in my life. I miss my Joey. My heart breaks for little Joey. There's always going to be an empty place at the table for little Joey. Can you picture that, friends? Can you picture that? See, is a mother's love limited to how many children she can love? Can, can she love just one, one child? Can she love two? Come on, moms. Can you love three, four? Yeah. Where do you think this kind of love comes from? It comes from God. It comes from Him. God loves you, friends. He loves you individually. He loves you personally. Don't let anybody tell you any difference. He had, you were not an afterthought. You were a forethought. God planned you. Even, even before you was born, you were planned. In your mother's womb, God planned you. He knows everything about you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He, he does. And He's calling you by name today. Right now, friends, it's time to come home and eat. It's time to come home. Friends, heaven is not going to be complete without you. God is waiting on you. This will be a perfect day today. Just to, to cry out to Him. Cry out to Him and, and, and in, invite Him to walk with you today with the rest of your life. He wants to be part of your life. 
Whatever bothers you bothers Him. He cares about you. He loves you, friends. Just know that. God wants to restore that broken relationship. He wants to bring you into His family. He wants to be part of your life for eternity. Boy, that's a deal you don't need to pass up. Can I pray for you, please? Okay. Father in heaven, thank you for your love. Father, you love us so much that, that you, to, for us to wrap our mind around the love we have for you, you have asked us to call you Father so that we can get a picture of, of just a little picture of the, of the relationship you want to have with us. Lord, thank you for the sacrifice that you've made that we can be part of the family of God, that we can be restored to the family of God. I plead the blood of Jesus for everyone watching and everyone that will watch this message. And I pray for you to, turn, to touch their hearts. Set the captives free. Impress upon them that you are a God of fresh new starts and a God of new beginnings and that you have restored that broken relationship and, and bring them back into your fold. And I thank you for doing that. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, thank you for joining us today. Uh, there's some time left. Go out there and get in some of that sunshine. But know that Jesus loves you and He's coming back soon to get you. Bye-bye.